The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily represent those of any organization, including One Generation Away. The freedom of a people to choose its leaders is the root of liberty. Keep alive this experiment in liberty. Liberty, in case you've forgotten, is the soul's right to breathe. Government should be very minimal in protecting liberty. Peace cannot be purchased at the cost of liberty. The sturdy ground of liberty. Liberty once lost is lost forever. Fight for their liberty liberty and for our security guarantees individual liberty this great republic born alone in liberty 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 just how much do you want liberty this is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner a production of libertynation.com cutting through the double talk taking on the topics going after what the politicians really mean and making it all clear for your freedom and your liberty Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. As predictable as the sun rising in the east, the left responds to dual gun-related tragedies by calling for more gun restrictions with control of the entire government. Will they get their way this time? Welcome back into Liberty Nation Radio, a production of LibertyNation.com and as always heard from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. We will discuss the latest debate about gun laws as the president, vice president, and Senate exploit the recent twin tragedies to signal their virtue and apply a full court press for more gun laws. Plus, we'll boil the whole debate down to simple truths, slogans of 10 words or less, which capture the essence of the gun control debate. Plus, LibertyNation.com economics correspondent Andrew Moran analyzes how the economy is recovering from the devastation of the pandemic one year after the onset. And LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza goes deep with the latest from the trial of the year, or perhaps the decade, the killing of George Floyd in Talking Liberty. Say what? Say what? Say what? One more time. We kick things off with our signature segment, Say What?, where we roll out an assembly line of wacky, astonishing, damnable, and ultimately revealing things uttered by politicians and the chattering class. The new president held his first press conference after more than two months in office and focused on his growing passion for removing the Senate filibuster, his disdain for Republicans opposed to ever more liberal voting laws, what he plans to do about China, not much. And of course, the thorn in his side, the border crisis, which began just as he took office following his promises as a candidate to rid the country of Trump's tough policies at the border, but for which he somehow found a way to blame Trump. The way to deal with this problem, and I started to deal with it back when I was a United States senator, I mean, a vice president, for putting together a bipartisan plan of over $700 million to do the root causes of why people are leaving. What did Trump do? He eliminated that funding. And in addition to that, what he did, he dismantled all the elements that exist to deal with what had been a problem and, and has been continued to be a problem for a long time. He, in fact, shut down the, uh, the number of beds available. It's fair to say that many Americans are critical of Donald Trump, but very few of them are upset that he wasn't effective in controlling the border. But hey, blame Trump for the border crisis, which you created, and take credit for the vaccines, which Trump sped along to full development. That's politics. Meanwhile, it's happening again, just as it has for lo these many years. A crazed gunman murders eight people in Atlanta. Another mows down 10 innocents in Boulder, Colorado. And the left uses the tragedies as another fresh opportunity to play on the emotions of the American people by pushing for stricter gun laws. None of which, none of which, like in every other tragedy like this, would have saved the victims. Because the perpetrators were criminals, which means they, by definition, do not obey the law. 
But President Biden began the gun grabbing chorus this time with a TV speech followed by his dutiful Vice President Harris on an interview on CBS. The Senate should immediately pass. Let me say it again. The United States Senate, I hope some are listening, should immediately pass the two House pass bills that close loopholes in the background check system. It is time for Congress to act and stop with the false choices. This is not about getting rid of the Second Amendment. It's simply about saying we need reasonable gun safety laws. There is no reason why we have assault weapons on the streets of a civil society. They are weapons of war. They are designed to kill a lot of people quickly. Yeah, as quickly as the left used raw emotion to exploit these tragedies as an excuse to remove more guns from the hands of innocent gun owners. We'll discuss how fundamental truth about guns can be captured in slogans, yes, in 10 words or less, a bit later in the show. But the Senate dutifully began another debate about gun control this week, and the man now apparently anointed to provide the daily entertainment in the swamp with Trump gone placed the entire argument in context, provoking cheers from the right and fury from the left. Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana. We have a lot of drunk drivers in America that kill a lot of people. But I think what many folks on my side of the aisle are saying is that the answer is not to get rid of all sober drivers. The answer is to concentrate on the problem. We have had a problem in this world for some time with both domestic and international terrorism. Many terrorists happen to be Muslims. When a Muslim jihadist blows up a school full of school children, we are often told not to condemn all of the actions of those of the Muslim faith because of the actions of a few. So why doesn't the same rule apply to the 100 million plus gun owners in America who are exercising their constitutional right. Have we as a society reached the point where the uncomplicated homespun and irrefutable logic of this lovable, quotable teddy bear from the bayou can be dismissed as merely another manifestation of America's white privilege and endemic racism? Apparently so. Because the far left, Trump crazed, gun crazed media took the opportunity to go one entirely predictable step further, going ballistic after Jay Baker, sheriff of Cherokee County, investigating the Atlanta spa shootings, which left four women of Asian descent dead, gave a head spinning explanation of the shooter Robert Aaron Long's motive. We know this is still early, but he does claim that it was not racially motivated. He apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex fiction, and sees these locations as something that allows him to uh, to um, to go to these places. And, and it's a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. He was pretty much fed up and kind of at the end of his rope. And, um, and yesterday was a really bad day for him, and this is what he did. A really bad day for him? Well, that said, the far left guy known as Capehart on MSNBC loose on a rampage centered around, well, who else? Discrimination and violence against Asian Americans have skyrocketed, thanks in part to Donald Trump and others who described the coronavirus pandemic in racist terms. This is scapegoating at its worst. But let's be honest, scapegoating is as American as apple pie. And because there's almost always a racial or ethnic dynamic to it in our country, scapegoating is the evil cousin of white supremacy. And together, they reinforce the notion that white is always in the right. Uh Uh-huh. Quick question for you. How many people do you know or have you even met who actually hate someone or love someone because of the color of their skin? But in America circa 2021, we're being told we're all racists. It's just that some of us don't realize it. Racism is a condition of the heart which, as best I can tell, is possessed by people of all races. But it's hard to deny any longer 
that we live in a society increasingly given over to this type of race consciousness, what's called wokeness, which best I can surmise means agreeing to blame everything ultimately on white people and believing every scripture of the extreme left. In recent weeks, we presented a psychologist and author, God Saad, G-A-D-S-A-A-D, and his top 20 reasons that society is heading to what he calls the abyss of ultimate lunacy. We've covered reasons 1 to 10. Today, we offer up numbers 11 through 15. 11. It is now racist to promote the ethos of individual dignity over collectivist identity politics. 12. It is now racist to criticize a noble person of color, be it a famous athlete or celebrity. 13. It is now transphobic to posit that only women menstruate. 14. It is now racist to publicly proclaim your support for, quote, wrong think black individuals such as Thomas Sowell or Larry Elder. 15. It is now misogynistic to note that women greatly outnumbered men in universities. In other words, facts no longer matter. As evidenced in the clip we played last week of Mr. Saad, of his reason number 10, it is now racist to argue that mathematics yields right and wrong answers because it might damage our self-esteem already so devastated from either the guilt of our whiteness or the victimhood of our non-whiteness. But let's close things up for Say What with something said by Donald Trump's director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, on Fox News this week, that you will find either fun, fantastical, or frightening. Can you tell us, have unidentified flying objects been seen? We have uh, lots of reports about what we call uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. There are a lot more sightings than have been made public. Some of those have been declassified. When we talk about sightings, we're talking about objects that have been seen by Navy or Air Force pilots or have been picked up by satellite imagery that, um, uh, frankly, um, engage in actions that are difficult to explain, that um, movements that, uh, that are hard to replicate, that we don't have the technology for, or traveling at speeds that you know, exceed the sound barrier without a, a sonic boom. So, in short, um, things that we are observing that are difficult to explain. Again, that's not some wild conspiracy theorist. It's the immediate past director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe. It seems the Defense Department has been studying these sightings for years and will issue a report by June 1st, seeking more money to discern whether or not we are being visited by objects or beings from other realms. Quick break, and then we're back to discuss how the economy is recovering from COVID and how it might withstand leftist demands for trillions more in taxes and spending. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. We believe that all men are entitled to blessings of liberty. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Well, we've now passed the one-year mark since the onset of the most deadly virus in a hundred years. We know the human toll, more than 500,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19, joblessness, which reached a frightening 20 percent at the height of the outbreak. Businesses shuttered. The off switch flipped on life as we knew it. So how well have we recovered from that dark and forbidding time? What remains to be done? When can we expect the economic devastation wrought by the pandemic to fully and finally pass? For answers, we turn, as always, to our economics guru from LibertyNation.com, the widely heralded Andrew Moran. Welcome back, Andrew. Well, thank you. Your instructions keep getting better and better. Well, thank you in return. 
Always good to have you. So let's start with the recovery from COVID to date, starting with the U.S. How well have we recovered and how have the actions of the fledgling Biden administration helped or hurt in the recovery? Well, when it comes to Bidenomics, I think it's too early to judge if President Biden is, is presiding over a good economy or a bad economy, just because he's only been in office for about two months, and much of what he, much of what he wants to enact, you know, has it come to fruition. So, so I think when it comes to grading Biden, give him six months, maybe a year, and then judge him on that record. But when it comes to the overall broader economy. Jerome Powell, he's ahead of the Fed, and he said that on an, an, an NPR interview recently that you know he's impressed by the recovery. And if you look at some of the main numbers, you know you, you could you could believe that the economy is doing well. Uh, the recent GDP for the fourth quarter it advanced uh, better than expected by four point three percent. Just uh, on the Thursday, the initial jobless numbers they fell to a more than one year low. Uh, of 600,000. Uh, all the purchasing manager index readings or the PMI, which measure economic trends, they're doing well. I mean, they're they're above uh, the expansion point of 50. So, you know, uh, on the surface, everything's doing well. But at the same time, you have to be cautious because all of this is being done with the trillions of dollars in fiscal and, mo- and monetary stimulus and relief. So, you know, what's going to happen when that starts tapering off, at least from the monetary side, when, you know, the, uh, Jerome Powell or his successor decides to start tightening, which, you know, could be a while. But, you know, there's already talk of, of, of tapering this, you know, multi trillion dollar uh, quantitative easing efforts. So the economy is on training wheels right now. Once those training wheels are off, who knows that bike will just, you know, fall off and scrape some needs and, or have, you know, major hemorrhaging that will need some stitches in a nearby hospital. All in all, what you've said is pretty encouraging. So let's broaden this out a, a little bit, Andrew. The U.S. national debt is now close to $30 trillion, almost unthinkable. And as we're discussing, we're coming out of a very dark period. But Joe Biden and the Democrats have big plans which will require big tax increases. How would a tax increase of any kind affect the current recovery? Yeah, well, the, you know, the U.S. economy is quite fragile right now. So any any significant tax hike, which I think the reports are calling it the biggest federal tax tax increases or reforms in 30 years. So so that that's pretty concerning. Uh, and, you know, everyone is treading on treading on water uh, on, or on thin water. Uh, unless you bought stock in AMC or GameStop, you know, you, you, or GameStop, excuse me, I think, you know, you're probably losing sleep at night over your, over your financial conditions. But it's not only the federal tax situation that people should be worried about. It's also the state and local governments that have, you know, had a, enormous spending over the last year to, you know, help the, help their uh, people recover or, you know, stay afloat. So, you know, in the years to come, they're going to have to start paying the bills and they're going to see these massive, uh, people are going to see these massive tax hikes, property taxes, water hikes, whatever they the case, whatever, you know, these states and, and local governments face. Uh, and then, of course, you have the most egregious, in my opinion, uh, tax of all, the inflation tax. You know, that's when you have a depreciating uh, purchasing power and higher prices. And people who are who, who are going to, you know, who, who live paycheck to paycheck, they're going to see the, these astronomical price hikes at the grocery store. You know, every sector of the economy is going to win this enormous price hikes and the U.S. dollar is, is losing its value. So that's, that's what I'm most concerned about. And, and then, of course, the fiscal tax situation at the federal level. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Andrew Moran, economics guru from LibertyNation.com. Quick break, then we'll be back to boil the whole debate about guns down to simple truths, how slogans of 10 words or less capture the essence of the gun control debate. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Far more important than my political future and far more important than yours, the well-being of our country. This is Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Well, we all know that slogans are as much a part of politics as speeches, yard signs, and attack ads. Some have been particularly memorable or successful. See if you can remember these. Barry Goldwater, in your heart, you know he's right. Ronald Reagan, it's morning in America. Barack Obama, hope and change. Donald Trump, make America great again. 
Joe Biden. I'm not Donald Trump. Seriously, though, some slogans work, others don't. Some are memorable, others are not. But nobody has more successfully conveyed truth through slogans than those fighting for the rights of gun owners who are now faced with uniform hostility across the full sweep of the federal government. It should hardly be necessary to repeat these fundamental truths all related to immutable human behavior, which were every bit as true 100 years ago or 500 years ago as they are today. But with innocent law-abiding gun owners being targeted by those who've historically defended the rights of criminals with particular vigor, these simple slogans convey absolute truth in less than 10 words. Consider these oldies for goodies. Remember this one? Guns don't kill people. People kill people. What words could better convey the reality that gun-related crime is caused by the shooter, not the weapon, by hearts and minds, not bullets? Would we feel better if, say, the 10 deaths in Boulder or the 58 in the Las Vegas massacre had resulted from a bomb instead of a gun, as was the case in, for example, Oklahoma City? Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Then there's this one. If guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. This is at the heart of the gun control issue. Would we respond to the break-in murder of a homeowner by saying that since a gun was responsible for the death, we need to take guns away from homeowners? That's the practical effect of most gun control measures. Criminals are criminals because they don't respect or obey the law. Yet we believe criminals will suddenly obey stiffer versions of laws they're already breaking with impunity? No, we can be certain that they will continue to break the law, just as those who've obeyed the law will continue to obey. Thus, it is quite obviously only law-abiding citizens will be penalized by more gun control measures. If guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. More guns, less crime. The most succinct of the slogans. This one cuts right to the bottom line. That more people carrying guns, most especially concealed guns, make for a safer society. Simple logic dictates that not knowing who's packing heat will make criminals less likely to ply their trade. And history's demonstrated that more concealed carry is to date the only policy that has succeeded in reducing gun-related crime. More guns, less crime. Then there's this one, 2.5 million defensive uses every year. The most informative slogan of all this one. The numbers change from year to year, but this phrase actually doubles as a fact. That makes it particularly cogent because it drives home arguably the most critical point about the Second Amendment. It's not about hunting or recreational shooting, as many on the left have tried to assert. It was placed in the Bill of Rights and in such a prominent position to assure arguably the most important element of individual freedom, the right to self-defense from criminals and, yes, from tyrants. Among the very first acts of tyrants ranging from the British king during the American Revolution to Hitler, Stalin, Castro in the full panoply of historical tyrants was disarming their citizens and leaving them defenseless. 2.5 million defensive uses every year. There's other simple but effective gun rights slogans and the reason they work is that the logic is so self-evident and to those who are intellectually honest, indisputable. But let's ask one more question. Who would be hit the hardest by ramped up gun control? Again, using simple logic, the answer would be high crime neighborhoods. Long the domain of the same Democrats now demanding fresh restrictions on the constitutional rights of their most loyal constituents. Do these gun grabbers even realize, not to mention acknowledge, The desperate need for self-defense in Democrat-run neighborhoods where criminals disproportionately run wild? We've seen the calls for more gun control after every major tragedy in our lives. 
even though history's consistently demonstrated that more gun control would have done nothing legally or behaviorally to stop any of the perpetrators. But Democrats who have forever assumed a strictly emotional stance on the issue are holding the whip hand in Washington and trying to ride the wave of impulsive public opinion in the immediate aftermath of a couple of tragedies. But they will soon discover, as they have so many times in recent years, that Americans endowed with common sense support ramped up gun control a whole lot more in principle than in practice. Quick break, and then we're back with Talking Liberty, featuring the latest from the trial of the year or the decade, the killing of George Floyd. Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com. With one click, you get tomorrow's news today with LNTV's Hot Topics and Analysis, Liberty Nation Radio, the Uprising and Rabbit Hole podcasts, and dozens of insightful original articles. And now, you can keep your kids ahead of the curve with LNGenZ.com. LNGenZ brings a free-thinking education right into your home for students of every grade level with articles, videos, worksheets, and ready-to-go curriculum. While the media establishment giants are sleeping, you can stay ahead of the curve with LibertyNation.com and get tomorrow's news today. LibertyNation.com Exhausted by all the fake news? On LibertyNation.com's YouTube channel, facts and fresh, bold analysis are what you get without the leftist spin. Subscribe today to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel and get our Ellen Radio, syndicated from coast to coast on the Radio America Network. Listen to all the big names and politics with your host, Tim Donner. LN TV, the right analysis with our Liberty Nation authors from across the globe. The Uprising Podcast, fun and entertaining commentary on what's really going on in the swamp with Scott Cosenza and Tim Donner. All this and more when you subscribe to the LibertyNation.com YouTube channel today. And now it is time to welcome you into the portion of Liberty Nation Radio, which we entitle Talking Liberty, as we welcome back in our regular contributor, constitutional lawyer, and our resplendent LibertyNation.com legal affairs editor, the man we call our guardian of individual liberty. I never thought I'd get to the name. Scott David Cosenza, welcome back, Scott. Oh, I got the full metal name, too, Tim. Thank you so much. You uh, got the you full me. metal jacket today, <laughs> yeah. my man. Indeed. Let's start with a quick update <laughs> on the trial of the year, or perhaps the decade. Derek Chauvin on trial for the killing of George Floyd. Tim, the trial will start on Monday. The jury has been picked. There are 15 total chosen now. If all 15 show up on Monday, the judge will toss one and proceed with four, 12 jurors and two alternates. Right now, there are uh, nine white people, four black people, two multiracial people. This is all according to the court definitions of who may be you know, multiracial versus right. black or white. Uh, and there are nine women and six men ranging in age from 20 to 60. Okay, so 60s, excuse me. So we'll we'll look greatly forward to your play by play of the trial as it begins and then continues. Who knows how long scheduled to go for a month, Tim. That's the schedule, but it could go longer, right? Certainly. Could, and then could it the possibly go depending. shorter than a month? Would it could it possibly go shorter than a month? It could, but. These things tend to sort of like construction. It's like, you know, you hear that it's going to be ready in six months. You think it's never going to be four months. You know, we better start on thinking about eight months. You know, you mean like the old money pit line? How long right. is it going to take every time they ask them for a renovation of the house? Two weeks. Yeah, right. Two weeks. OK, gun control. Big issue now <clears throat> in the wake of the Boulder and Atlanta tragedies. And of course, the Senate is talking big as they always do <clears throat> after one or more of these tragedies, how great would you say the threat is that serious gun gun law enhancements are going to occur in a government now controlled by Democrats from end to end? Well, barely. 
uh, to that last point you made, right? So the U.S. Right. Senate is, is uh, uh, you know, they've got 50-50 and on guns, unlike some other things, it's not that hard to find a Democrat, you know, who may vote the other way on guns, which is to say uh, to, to vote uh, against more restrictions on guns. I think the thing to fear most, Tim, for those of us that are liberty minded is what Joe Biden or those uh, who are have the keys to the car in the Biden administration, what they'll do with the executive power, um, both that is currently exercised and also what they envision and may get away with uh, as executive power. Just like Donald Trump kind of invented this new authority to ban devices previously uh, held legal with the bump stock thing. And, you know, we talked about it many times, Tim. It's a minor thing when you count up sort of the number of bump stocks in circulation relative to the population. But it's a major thing when you talk about the precedent involved. And if you agree that Donald Trump can take bump stocks and make them illegal and make people who possess them felons like that, well, then it uh, it doesn't bode well for what uh, Joe Biden might do if he gets creative. Guns in the crosshairs on Capitol Hill and at the White House. Meanwhile, Scott, prosecutors apparently abandoning some claims in the U.S. Capitol riot cases. I think it's important to talk about this, Tim, because over and over again, I hear. And in fact, I just heard it uh, this week on the radio um, on the local sort of all news station. They were talking about just filling in an update for where things were with uh, with the prosecutions in this case. And they talked about how how it was a very deadly riot. And, you know, it was deadly for the four rioters that died. It may have been deadly for the one police officer who died sometime later and wasn't, uh, you know, murdered by somebody intentionally. Uh, But the notion that this is somehow uh, uh, really good justification, Tim, for a move into some sort of new security state, which we see especially in the nation's capital, I think it's always important to circle back around to those fantastic claims that the kind of gave life to that sort of, uh, you know, security state structure. And, and when we see that they're, they're watered down in weak sauce later on, well, uh, it, it just reinforces the notion that any time power comes for our rights, we have to stand up and say, no, yes, not even now for whatever the latest tragedy is, not even to save the children or whatever it may be. This is yet another case where spectacular claims are made on the front pages of the newspapers, and when they turn out not to be true, weeks later, they're buried in Section B, page 13, and nobody notices. Well, to be fair, Tim, the prosecutors in this case, they didn't uh, hold a press conference uh, to announce this news like they did uh, you know, the news yeah. of, their, uh, of their arrests. I'm shocked, shocked and saddened, Scott. Yeah. So another big item on the Leftist wish list, God, is the $15 an hour minimum wage. But we now get word that many grocery stores are being shut down in low income neighborhoods in the face of these mandatory raises for employees. Yeah. So this isn't the $15 minimum wage, Tim. This is a $5. They call it like a hero pay or uh, th- these other terms for grocery store workers um, in uh, different areas in California who just, you know, are more free to vote away the money uh, of the people that live there. And they just decided that these Ralph's and uh, another brand of grocery store employees all under the Kroger brand, um, they just decided not to pay. They said it was going to be $20 million over the group of stores just for the next 120 days to cover this additional $5 per hour per employee. The articles that I read on it uh, show that most of their employees make a near $20 an hour as it is. So it's not like these people are, uh, you know, starvation wages. And uh, this is all about helping, Tim. And I know that you like to talk about one-step thinking, of course. And, and the one-step thinking is just that these people don't have enough money or it would be nice if they had more. So we'll just vote that their employers give them more money. Now they don't have a job. And also, just as importantly, how often have we heard about these food deserts from those on the progressive left? Uh, well, all these supermarkets are not where Rich Whitey lives. You know, there's plenty of business for them to cover an additional five bucks an hour for some staff. These are places where the marginal, uh, economically marginalized people live. Uh, they're going to have to now go walk, whatever, travel and burden themselves more because the politicians in these areas wanted, uh, you know, to help people. Uh, <laughs> 
classic left is one step thinking. People aren't making enough money, so simply <clears throat> mandate that they make more. And you know, not the markets also said while this was being considered, that this is likely what would happen, and they did it anyway. It's not like they can say they didn't know. Well, Scott, they have to signal their virtue somehow. Yeah, all right. Now, meanwhile, driving a Prius just doesn't cut it. You know, it hasn't for a long time, Tim. Meanwhile, I, this is, I think, happened that anybody who's taken their kid to school or more precisely went to pick them up. They're a little bit late. The kids left standing. It happens to every parent. But in one case, a parent, uh, a mom who was seven minutes late to pick up her 10 year old son, uh, had the school call child services on her. Yeah, to be fair, that headline may be just a skosh misleading. She was technically 37 minutes late. The, the, the school gives a 30 minute grace period and then like then you're in trouble. Right. So it was seven minutes into the trouble zone and it was confused. It was like the second week or day back at school uh, after the, the covid. This was a Chicago public school, Tim. The mother is also a Chicago public school teacher. Uh, it is, you know. Has there been a story that's come out of the COVID that has recommended to you the continuation of the public school system? Because the they seem to be all anti-student, anti-parent stories that that that, that come across my uh, my desk, and and this is just another one. And uh, it's not uh, Scott. It's not anti-student. It's pro-teacher, pro-union. And you think about them. You know, once the uh, child protective services people get a hold of you, you know, they're entrepreneurial too. They're not interested in canceling. I, they're not interested in like, oh, that was just a nothing burger. Oh, ha, ha, we'll just you know put that aside after two minutes of investigation. Oh, no, they're now in, want to get involved in your life and come and examine and home visits and every other thing. Uh, it's a terrifying ordeal for some. Meanwhile, I'm going to keep this last story in mind, and you will, too, because you're going to be hitting a plane pretty soon. And as you walk through security, you apparently have the right to tape a TSA agent, or putting it in terms of a negative right, you're not prohibited from filming them, according to a court. Well, this could be a very important case moving forward. The two heroes in the case are Judge Gibney and Dustin Dyer. Mr. Dyer is a lawyer who was uh, filming TSA agents who then required him to delete the footage, and he sued so that's why he's a hero, because if you don't sue on these things, unfortunately, the rights kind of die. Uh, and what Judge Gibney has said is that the the important ruling, well, the, there's two important rulings. Is number one, that the, the right does exist to tape the TSA agents. And the second ruling is that the TSA agents should have known that even though there wasn't an explicit law that allowed it to be done or an explicit case on point that required them to allow it, that the Constitution itself mandated the TSA agent allow this activity and should have known why. Tim, this is a qualified immunity case and qualified immunity means that, well, he didn't really know or shouldn't necessarily be bound to the law. So yes, it was illegal, but we're not going to allow you to recover a lot of dough. Uh, so we'll see. This is bound to be appealed, Tim, and uh, we'll see. It's in our I backyard love the, in the Fourth I, Circuit. I love the defense uh, that there's no law saying that you're allowed to tape a TSA agent. It's sort of like saying there's no law saying you're allowed to wear a hat, Scott. So the next time I see you with it, I'm going to point that out to you. This is what's so maddening about the judge-made doctrine of qualified immunity and why so many of us think it has to change, Tim. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thanks, Tim. Scott Cosenza, legal affairs editor at LibertyNation.com. This program, Liberty Nation Radio and LibertyNation.com's own podcasts, The Uprising, hosted by Scott, and The Rabbit Hole, Politics and Prose, all available on demand at LibertyNation.com and from fine podcast providers everywhere. So that is it for this week, but we will be back at you next week. Same time, same station. Till then, this is Tim Donner saying, stand up for liberty. And we'll see you next time on Liberty Nation Radio. Liberty Nation.